Chapter 33 From Athens all through the islands of the Grecian archipelago, we saw little but forb forbidding sea walls and barren hills, sometimes surmounted by three or four graceful columns of some ancient temple, lonely and deserted, a fitting symbol of the desolation that has come upon all Greece in these latter ages. We saw no plowed fields, very few villages, no trees or grass or vegetation of any kind, scarcely and hardly ever an isolated house. Greece is a bleak, unsmiling desert without agriculture, manufacturers, or commerce, apparently. What supports its poverty-stricken people or its government is a mystery. I suppose that ancient Greece and modern Greece compared furnish the most extravagant contrast to be found in history. George I, an infant of 18 and a scraggy nest of foreign office holders, sit in the places of Themistocles, Pericles, and the illustrious scholars and generals of the Golden Age of Greece. The fleets that were the wonder of the world when the Parthenon was new are a beggarly handful of fish and smacks now, and the manly people that performed such miracles of valor at Marathon are only a tribe of unconsidered slaves today. The classic Eleusius has gone dry, and so have all the sources of Grecian wealth and wealth greatness. The nation numbers only 800,000 souls, and there is poverty and misery and mendacity enough among them to furnish 40 millions and be liberal about it. Under King Otho, the revenues of the state were five millions of dollars, raised from a tax of one-tenth of all the agricultural products of the land which tenth the farmer had to bring to the royal granaries on pack mules any distance not exceeding six leagues, and from extravagant taxes on trade and commerce. Out of that five millions, the small tyrant tried to keep an army of ten thousand men, pay all the hundreds of useless grand, grand equerries and waitings, first grooms of the bedchamber, lord high chancellors of the exploded exchequer, and all the other absurdities which these puppet kingdoms indulge in, in imitation of the great monarchies. And in addition, he set about building a white marble palace to count about five millions itself. The result was, simply, Ten into five goes no times and none over. All these things could not be done with five millions, and Otho fell into trouble. The Greek throne, with its unpromising adjuncts of a ragged population of ingenious rascals who were out of employment eight months in the year, because there was little for them to borrow and less to confiscate, and a waste of barren hills and weed-grown deserts, went begging for a good while. It was offered to one of Victoria's sons, and afterwards to various other younger sons of royalty who had no thrones and were out of business. But they all had the charity to decline the dreary honor and veneration enough for Greece's ancient great greatness to refuse to mock her sorrowful rags and dirt with a tinsel throne in this day of her humiliation. Till they came to this young Danish George, and he took it. He has finished the splendid palace I saw in the radiant moonlight the other night, and is doing many other things for the salvation of Greece, they say. We sailed through the barren archipelago and into the narrow channel they sometimes call the Dardanelles and sometimes the Hellespont. This part of the country is rich in historic reminiscences 
and poor as Sahara and everything else. For instance, as we approached the Dardanelles, we coasted along the plains of Troy and passed the mouth of the Scamander, where we saw Troy had stood in the distance, and where it does not stand now, a city that perished when the world was young. The poor Trojans are all dead now. They were born too late to see Noah's Ark, and died too soon to see our menagerie. We saw where Agamemnon's fleets rendezvoused, and away inland a mountain, which the map said was Mount Ida. Within the Hellespont we saw where the original first shoddy contract mentioned in history was carried out, and the parties of the second part gently rebuked it by Xerxes. I speak of the famous bridge of boats which Xerxes ordered to be built over the narrowest part of the Hellespont, where it is only two or three miles wide. A moderate gale destroyed the flimsy structure, and the king, thinking that to publicly rebuke the contractors might have a good effect on the next set, called them out before the army and had them beheaded. In the next ten minutes, he read a new contract for the bridge. It has been observed by ancient writers that the second bridge was a very good bridge. Xerxes crossed his host of five millions of men on it, and if it had not been purposely destroyed, it would probably have been there yet. If our government would rebuke some of our shoddy contractors occasionally, it might work much good. In the Hellespont, we saw where Leander and Lord Byron swam across, the one to see her upon whom his soul's affections were fixed with a devotion that only death could impair, and the other merely for a flyer, as Jack says. We had two noted tombs near us, too. On one shore slept Ajax, and on the other, Hecuba. We had water batteries and forts on both sides of the Hellespont, flying the crimson flag of Turkey, with its white crescent and occasionally a village, and sometimes a train of camels. We had all these to look at till we entered the broad sea of Marmora, and then the land soon fading from view we resumed Euchre and Whist once more. We dropped anchor in the mouth of the Golden Horn at daylight in the morning. Only three or four of us were up to see the great Ottoman capital. The passengers did not turn out at unseasonable hours, as they used to, to get the earliest possible glimpse of strange foreign cities. We are well over that. If we were lying in sight of the pyramids of Egypt, they would not come on deck until after breakfast nowadays. The Golden Horn is a narrow arm of the sea, which branches from the Bosporus, a sort of a broad river which connects the Marmora and Black Seas, and, curving around, divides the city in the middle. Galata and Pera are on one side of the Bosporus and the Golden Horn. Stamboul, ancient Byzantium, is upon the other. On the other bank of Bosporus is Scutari and other suburbs of Constantinople. This great city contains a million inhabitants, but so narrow are its streets and so crowded together are its houses that it does not cover much more than half as much ground as New York City. Seen from the anchorage or from a mile or so upon the Bosporus, it is by far the handsomest city we have seen. Its dense array of houses swells upwards from the water's edge and spreads over the domes of many hills. And the gardens that peep out here and there, the great globes of the mosques, and the countless minarets that meet the eye everywhere, invest the metropolis with the quaint oriental aspect one dreams of when he reads books of eastern travel. Constantinople makes a noble picture. 
but its attractiveness begins and ends with its picturesqueness. From the time one starts ashore till he gets back again, he execrates it. The boat he goes in is admirably, admirably miscalculated for the service it is built for. It is handsomely and neatly fitted up, but no man could handle it well in the turbulent currents that sweep down the Bosporus from the Black Sea, and few men could row it satisfactorily even in still water. It is a long, light canoe, large at one end and tapering to a knife blade at the other. They make that long, sharp end of the bow, and you can imagine how these boiling currents spin it about. It has two oars, and sometimes four, and no rudder. You start to uh, go to a given point, and you run in fifty different directions before you get there. First one oar is back in water, and then the other. It is seldom that both are going ahead at once. This kind of boating is calculated to drive an impatient man mad in a week. The boatmen are the awkwardest, the stupidest, and the most unscientific on earth, without question. Ashore, it was, well, it was an eternal circus. People were thicker than bees in those narrow streets, and the men were dressed all in the outrageous, outlandish, idolatrous, extravagant, thunder and lightning costumes that ever a tailor with the delirium tremens and seven devils could conceive of. There was no freak in dress too crazy to be indulged in, no absurdity too absurd to be tolerated. No frenzy and ragged diabolism too fanatic to be attempted. No two men were dressed alike. It was a wild masquerade of all imaginable costumes. Every struggling throng in every street was a dissolving view of stunning contrasts. Some patriarchs wore awful turbans, but the grand mass of the infidel horde wore the fiery red skull cap they call a fez. All the remainder of the raiment they indulged in was utterly indescribable. The shops here are mere coops, mere boxes, bathrooms, closets, anything you please to call them, on the first floor. The Turks sit cross-legged in them, and work and trade and smoke long pipes and smell like, like Turks. That covers the ground. Crowding the narrow streets in front of them are beggars, who beg forever, yet never collect anything. And wonderful cripples, distorted out of all semblance of humanity, almost. Vagabonds driving laden asses, porters carrying dry goods boxes as large as cottages on their backs, peddlers of grapes, hot corn, pumpkin seeds, and a hundred other things, yelling like fiends and sleeping happily, comfortably, serenely, among the hurrying feet are the famed dogs of Constantinople. Drifting noiselessly, noiselessly about are squads of Turkish women, draped from chin to feet in flowing robes, and with snowy veils bound about their heads. They disclose only the eyes and a vague, shadowy notion of their features. Seen moving about, Far away in the dim, arched aisles of the great bazaar, they look as the shrouded dead must have looked when they walked forth from the grave amid the storms and thunders and earthquakes that burst upon Calvary that awful night of the crucifixion. A street in Constantinople is a picture which one ought to see once, not often. And then there was the Goose Rancher, a fellow who drove a hundred geese before him about the city and tried to sell them. He had a pole ten feet long with a crook in the end of it, and occasionally a goose would branch out from the flock and make a lively break around the corner with wings half lifted and neck stretched to its utmost. Did the goose merchant get excited? No. He took the pole and reached after that goose with unspeakable sanguard took a hitch round his neck and yanked him back into his place in the flock without an effort. 
He steered his youth with that stick as easily as another man would steer a yawl. A few hours afterwards, we saw him sitting on a stone at a corner in the midst of the turmoil, sound asleep in the sun, with his knees squatting around him, or dodging out of the way of asses and men. We came by again within the hour, and he was taking account of stock to see whether any of his flock had strayed or been stolen. The way he did it was unique. He put the end of his stick within six or eight inches of the stone wall and made the geese march in single file between it and the wall. He counted them as they went by. There was no dodging that arrangement. If you want dwarfs, I mean just a few dwarfs for a curiosity, go to Genoa. If you wish to buy them by the gross, for retail, go to Milan. There were plenty of dwarfs all over Italy, but it did seem to me that in Milan the crop was luxuriant. If you would see a fair, average style of assorted cripples, go to Naples or travel through the Roman states. But if you would see the very heart and home of cripples and human monsters, both, go straight to Constantinople. A beggar in Naples who can show a foot which is all run into one horrible toe, with one shapeless nail on it, has a fortune. But such an exhibition as that would not provoke any notice in Constantinople. The man would starve. Who would pay any attention to attractions like his among the rare monsters that throng the bridge of the Golden Horn and display their deformities in the gutters of Stamboul? O oh, wretched impostor, how could he stand against the three-legged woman and the man with his eye in his cheek? How would he blush in presence of the man with fingers on his elbow? Where would he hide himself when the dwarf with seven fingers on each hand, no upper lip, and his underjaw gone, came down in his majesty? Bismillah! The cripples of Europe are a delusion and a fraud. The truly gifted flourish only in the byways of Para and Stamboul. That three-legged woman lay on the bridge, with her stock in trade so disposed as to command the most striking effect. One natural leg and two long, slender, twisted ones with feet on them like somebody else's forearm. Then there was a man further along who had no eyes and whose face was the color of a fly-blown beefsteak and wrinkled and twisted like a lava flow. And verily, so tumbled and distorted were his features that no man could tell the wart that served him for a nose from his cheekbones. In Stamboul was a man with a prodigious head, an uncommonly long body, legs eight inches long and feet like snowshoes. He traveled on those feet in his hands and was as sway-backed as if the Colossus of Rhodes had been riding him. Ah, a beggar has to have exceedingly good points to make a living in Constantinople. A blue-faced man who had nothing to offer except that he had been blown up in a mine would be regarded as a rank impostor, and a mere damaged soldier on crutches would never make a cent. It would pay him to get a piece of his head taken off and cultivate a win like a carpet sack. The mosque of St. Sophia is the chief lion of Constantinople. You must get a firman and hurry there the first thing. We did that. We did not get a firman, but we took along four or five francs apiece, which is much the same thing. I do not think much of the mosque of St. Sophia. I suppose I lack appreciation. We will let it go at that. It is the rustiest old barn in heathendom. I believe all the interest that attaches to it comes from the fact that it was built for a Christian church and then turned into a mosque, without much alteration, by the Mohammedan conquerors of the land. They made me take my boots off and walk into the place in my stocking feet. I caught cold and got myself so stuck up with a complication of gums slime, and general corruption that I wore out more than 2,000 pair of boot jacks getting my boots off that night, and even then some Christian hide, Christian hide peels off with them. I abate not a single boot jack. 
St. Sophia is a colossal church, 13 or 1400 years old, and unsightly enough to be very, very much older. Its immense dome is said to be more wonderful than St. Peter's, but its dirt is much more wonderful than its dome, though they never mention it. The church has a hundred and seventy pillars in it, each a, a single piece and all of costly marbles of various kinds, but they came from ancient temples at Baalbek, Heliopolis, Athens, and Ephesus, and are battered, ugly, and repulsive. They were a thousand years old when this church was new, and then the contrast must have been ghastly if Justinian's architects did not trim them in. The inside of the dome is figured all over with monstrous inscription in Turkish characters, wrought in gold mosaic that looks as glaring as a circus bell. The pavements and the marble balustrades are all battered and dirty. The perspective is marred everywhere by a web of ropes that depend from the dizzy height of the dome and suspend countless dingy, coarse oil lamps and ostrich eggs six or seven feet above the floor, squatting and sitting in groups here and there and near and far, were ragged Turks reading books, hearing sermons, or receiving lessons like children. And in fifty places were more of the same sort, bowing and straightening up, bowing again and getting down to kiss the earth, muttering prayers the while, and keeping up their gymnastics till they ought to have been tired if they were not. Everywhere was dirt and dust and dinginess and gloom. Everywhere were signs of a hoary antiquity, but with nothing touching or beautiful about it. Everywhere were those groups of fantastic pagans, overhead the gaudy mosaics and the web of lamp ropes. Nowhere was there anything to win one's love or challenge his admiration. The people who go into ecstasies over St. Sophia must surely get them out of the guidebook, where every church is spoken of as being considered by good judges to be the most marvelous structure, in many respects, that the world has ever seen. Or else they are those old connoisseurs from the wilds of New Jersey who laboriously learn the difference between a fresco and a fire plug, and from that day forward feel priv privileged to void their critical bathos on painting, sculpture, and architecture forevermore. We visited the dancing dervishes. There were 21 of them. They wore a long, light-colored, loose robe that hung to their heels. Each in his turn went up to the priest. They were all within a large, circular railing, and bowed profoundly, and then went spinning away deliriously and took his appointed place in the circle and continued to spin. When all had spun themselves to their places, they were about five or six feet apart, and so situated the entire circle of spinning pagans spun itself three separate times around the room. It took 25 minutes to do it. They spun on the left foot and kept themselves going by passing the right rapidly before it and digging it against the waxed floor. Some of them made incredible time, most of them spun around 40 times in a minute, and one artist averaged about 60 times a minute and kept it up during the whole 25. His robes filled with air and stood out all around him like a balloon. They made no noise of any kind, and most of them tilted their heads back and closed their eyes, entranced with a sort of devotional ecstasy. There was a rude kind of music part of the time, but the musicians were not visible. None but spinners were allowed to remain within the circle. A man had to either spin or stay outside. It was about as barbarous an exhibition as we have witnessed yet. Then sick persons came and lay down, and beside them women laid their sick children, one a babe at the breast. And the patriarch of the dervishes walked upon their bodies, he was supposed to cure their diseases by trampling, trampling upon their breasts or backs, or standing on the back of their necks. This is well enough for a people who think 
all their affairs are made for Lord by these are spirits of the air, by giants, gnomes, and genie, and who still believe to this day all the wild tales in the Arabian Nights. Even so, an, er, an intelligent missionary tells me. We visited the thousand and one columns. I do not know what it was originally intended for, but they said it was built for a reservoir. It is situated in the center of Constantinople. You go down a flight of stone steps in the middle of a barren place, and there you are. You are 40 feet underground and in the midst of a perfect wilderness of tall, slender, granite columns of Byzantine architecture. Stand where you would, or change your position as often as you pleased. You were always a center from which radiated a dozen long archways and colonnades that lost themselves in distance in the somber twilight of the place. This old, dried-up reservoir is occupied by a few ghostly silk spinners now, and one of them showed me a cross cut high up in one of the pillars. I suppose he meant me to understand that the institution was there before the Turkish, Turkish occupation, and I thought he made a remark to that effect, but he must have had an impediment in his speech, for I did not understand him. We took off our shoes and went into the marble mausoleum of the Sultan Mahmoud, the neatest piece of architecture inside that I have seen lately. Mahmoud's tomb was covered with a black velvet pall, which was elaborately embroidered with silver. It stood within a fancy silver railing. At the sides and corners were silver candlesticks that would weigh more than a hundred pounds, and they supported candles as large as a man's leg. On the top of the sarcophagus was a fez with a handsome diamond ornament upon it which an attendant said cost a hundred thousand pounds, and lied like a Turk when he said it. Mahmoud's whole family were comfortably planted around him. We went to the great bazaar in Stamboul, of course, and I shall not describe it further than to say it is a monstrous hive of little shops, thousands, I should say, all under one roof, and cut up into innumerable little blocks by narrow streets which, streets which are arched overhead. One street is devoted to a particular kind of merchandise, another to another, and so on. When you wish to buy a pair of shoes, you have the swing of the whole street. You do not have to walk yourself down, hunting stores in different localities. It is the same with silks, antiques, shawls, etc. The place is crowded with people all the time. And as the gay-colored eastern fabrics are lavishly displayed before every shop, the great bazaar of Stamboul is one of the sights that are worth seeing. It is full of life and stir and business. Dirt, beggars, asses, yelling peddlers, porters, dervishes, high-born Turkish female shoppers, Greeks and weird-looking and weirdly-dressed Mohammedans from the mountains and the far provinces. And the only solitary thing one does not smell when he is in the great bazaar is something which smells good. Chapter 34 Mosques are plenty, churches are plenty, and graveyards are plenty. But morals and whiskey are scarce. The Koran does not permit Mohammedans to drink. Their natural instincts do not permit them to be moral. They say the Sultan has 800 wives. This almost amounts to bigamy. It makes our cheeks burn with shame to see such a thing permitted here in Turkey. We do not mind it so much in Salt Lake, however. Circassian and Georgian girls are still sold in Constantinople by their parents, but not publicly. The great slave marts we have all read so much about, where tender young girls were stripped for inspection and criticized and discussed, just as if they were horses at an agricultural fair, no longer exist. The exhibition and the sales are private now. Stocks are up just at present. 
partly because of a brisk demand created by the recent return of the Sultan's suite from the courts of Europe, partly on account of an unusual abundance of breadstuffs which leaves holders untortured by hunger and enables them to hold back for high prices, and partly because buyers are too weak to bear the market while sellers are amply prepared to bully. Under these circumstances, if the American metropolitan newspapers were published here in Constantinople, their commercial report would read as follows, I suppose. Slave Girl Market Report Best Brands, Circassians, Crop of 1850, L200, 1852, L250, 1854, L300. Best Brands of Georgian, None in Market, Second Quality, 1851, L180. 19 fair to middling Wallachian girls offered at L130 at 150. But no takers. 16 prime A. A1 sold in small lots to close out. Terms private. Sales of one lot Circassians prime to good 1852 to 1854 at L240. At 242, a buyer 30, 149er damaged at L23, seller 10, no deposit. Several Georgians, fancy brands, 1852, changed hands to fill orders. The Georgians now on hand are mostly last year's crop, which was unusually poor. The new crop is a little backward, but will be coming in shortly. As regards its quantity and quality, the accounts are most encouraging. In this connection, we can safely say also that the new crop of Circassians is looking extremely well. His Majesty the Sultan has already set in large numbers for his new harem which will be finished within a fortnight. And this has naturally strengthened the market and given Circassian a stock a strong upward tendency. Taking advantage of the inflated market, many of our shrewdest operators are selling short. There are hints of a corner on Wallachians. There is nothing new in Nubians, slow sale. Eunuchs, none offering. However, large cargoes are expected from Egypt today. I think the above would be about the style of the commercial report. Prices are pretty high now, and holders firm. But two or three years ago, parents in a starving condition brought their young daughters down here and sold them for even 20 and $30. When they could do no better, simply to save themselves and the girls of dying of want. It is sad to think of so distressing a thing as this. And I, for one, am sincerely glad the prices are up again. Commercial morals, especially, are bad. There is no gainsay in that. Greek, Turkish, and Armenian morals consist only in attending church regularly on the appointed Sabbaths, and in breaking the Ten Commandments all the balance of the week. It comes natural to them to lie and cheat in the first place, and then they go on and improve on nature until they arrive at perfection. In recommending his son to a merchant as a valuable salesman, the father does not say he is a nice, moral, upright boy and goes to Sunday school and is honest, but he says, This boy is worth his hundred weight in broad pieces of a hundred. For behold, he will cheat whomover, whomsoever hath dealings with him, and from the X-Wing to the waters of Marmora, there abideth not so gifteth, gifted a liar. How is that for a recommendation? The missionaries tell me that they hear echomeniums like that passed upon people every day. They say of a person they admire, Ah, he is a charming swindler, and a most exquisite liar. Everybody lies and cheats. Everybody who is in business, at any rate. Even foreigners have to soon have to come down to the custom of the country, and they do not buy and sell long in Constantinople till they lie and cheat like a Greek. I say like a Greek because the Greeks are called the worst transgressors in this line. Several Americans long resident in Constantinople, Constantinople contend that most Turks are pretty trustworthy but few claim that the Greeks have any virtues that a man can discover, at least without a fire assay. I am half willing to believe that the celebrated dogs of Constantinople have been misrepresented, slandered. 
I have always been led to suppose that they were so thick in the streets that they blocked the way, that they moved about in organized companies, platoons, and regiments, and took what they wanted by determined and ferocious assault, and that at night they drowned all other, other sounds with their terrible howlings. The dogs I see here cannot be those I have read of. I find them everywhere, but not in strong force. The most I have found together have been about ten or twenty, and night or day a fair proportion of them were sound asleep. Those were, that were not asleep always looked as if they wanted to be. I never saw such utterly wretched, starving, sad-visaged, broken-hearted looking curs in my life. It seemed a grim satire to accuse such brutes as these of taking things by force of arms. They hardly seemed to have strength enough or ambitionous, ambition enough to walk across the street. I do not know that I have seen one walk that far yet. They are mangy and bruised and mutilated, and you often see one with the hair singed off him in such a wide and well-defined tracks that he looks like a map of the new territories. They are the sorriest beasts that breed, the most abject, the most pitiful. In their faces is a settled expression of melancholy, an air of hopeless despondency. The hairless patches on a scalded dog are preferred by the thieves of Constantinople to a wider range on a healthier dog, and the exposed places suit the fleas exactly. I saw of this dog of this kind start to nibble at a flea. A fly attracted his attention, and he made a snatch at him. The flea called for him once more, and that forever unsettled him. He looked sadly at his flea pasture, then sadly looked at his bald spot. Then he heaved a sigh and dropped his head resignedly upon his paws. He was not equal to the situation. The dogs sleep in the streets, all over the city, from one end of the street to the other. I suppose they will average about eight or ten to a block. Sometimes, of course, there are fifteen or twenty to a block. They do not belong to anybody, and they seem to have no close personal friendships among each other. But they district the city themselves, and the dogs of each district, whether it be half a block in extent or ten blocks, have to remain within its bounds. Woe to a dog if he crosses the line, his neighbors would snatch the balance of his hair off in a second, so it is said, but they don't look it. They sleep in the streets these days. They are my compass, my guide. When I see the dogs sleep placidly on, while men, sheep, geese, and all moving things turn out and go around them, I know I am not in the great street where the hotel is, and must go further. In the Grand Rue, the dogs have a sort of air of being on the lookout, an air born of being obliged to get out of the way of many carriages every day, and that expression one recognizes in a moment. It does not exist upon the face of any dog without the confines of that street. All the others sleep placidly and keep no watch. They would not move, though the sultan himself passed by. In one narrow street, but none of them are wide, I saw three dogs lying coiled up, about a foot or two apart. End to end they lay, and so they just bridged the street neatly from gutter to gutter. A drove of a hundred sheep came along. They stepped right over the dogs, the rear crowding the front, impatient to get on. The dogs looked lazily up, flinched a little when the impatient feet of the sheep touched their raw backs, sighed, and lay peacefully down again. No talk could be plainer than that, so some of the sheep jumped over them and others scrambled between, occasionally chipping a leg with their sharp hoofs. And when the whole flock had made the trip, the dogs sneezed a little in the cloud of dust, but never budged their bodies an inch. I thought I was lazy, but I am a steam engine compared to a Constantinople dog. But was not that a singular scene for a city of a million inhabitants? These dogs are the scavengers of the city. That is their official position, and a hard one it is. However, it is their protection. 
but for their usefulness in partially cleansing these terrible streets, they would not be tolerated long. They eat anything and everything that comes in their way, from melon rinds and spoiled grapes, up to all the grades and species of dirt and refuse for their own dead friends and relatives. And yet they are always lean, always hungry, always despondent. The people are loath to kill them, do not kill them, in fact. The Turks have an innate, an innate antipathy, antipathy for taking the life of any dumb animal. It is said that they do worse. They hang and kick and stone and scald these wretched creatures to the very verge of death, and then leave them to live and suffer. Once a sultan proposed to kill off all the dogs here, and did begin the work, but the populace raised such a howl of horror about it that the massacre was stayed. After a while, he proposed to remove them all to an island in the Sea of Marmora. No objection was offered, and a shipload or so was taken away. But when it came to be known that somehow or the other the dogs never got to the island, but always fell overboard in the night and perished, another howl was raised and a transportation scheme was dropped. So the dogs remain in peaceable possession of the streets. I do not say that they do not howl at night, nor that they do not attack people who have not a red fez on their heads. I only say that it would be mean for me to accuse them of these unseemly things, who have not seen them do them with my own eyes, or heard them with my own ears. I was a little surprised to see Turks and Greeks playing newsboy right here in the mysterious land where the giants and genie of the Arabian Nights once dwelt, where winged horses and hydra-headed dragons guarded enchanted castles where princes and princesses flew through the air on carpets that obeyed a mystic talisman, where cities whose houses were made of precious stones sprang up in a night under the hands of the magician, and where busy marts were suddenly stricken with a spell, and each citizen sat or lay or stood with weapon raised or foot advanced, just as he was, speechless and motionless, till time had told a hundred years. It was curious to see newsboys selling papers in so grainy a land as that. And, to say truly, it is comparatively a new thing here. The selling of newspapers had its birth in Constantinople about a year ago, and was a child of the Prussian and Austrian War. There was one pa paper here, published in the English language, the Levant Herald, and there are generally a number of Greek and a few French papers rising and falling, struggling up and falling again. Newspapers are not popular with the Sultan's government. They do not understand journalism. The proverb says, the unknown is always great. To the court, the newspaper is a mysterious and rascally institution. They know what a pestilence is, because they have one occasionally that thins the people out at the rate of 2,000 a day, and they regard a newspaper as a mild form of pestilence. When it goes astray, they suppress it, pounce upon it without warning, and throttle it. When it don't go astray for a long time, they get suspicious and throttle it anyhow, because they think that it is hatching deviltry. Imagine the Grand Vizier and Solemn Consul, Consul with the magnates of the realm, spelling his way through the hated newspaper and finally delivering his profound decision. This thing means mischief. It is too darkly, too suspiciously inoffensive. Suppress it. Warn the publisher that we cannot have this sort of thing. Put the editor in prison. The newspaper business has its inconveniences in Constantinople. Two Greek papers and one French one were suppressed here within a few days of each other. No victories of the Cretans are allowed to be printed. From time to time, the Grand Vizier sends a notice to the various editors that the Cretan insurrection is entirely suppressed. And although that editor knows better, he still has to print the notice. The Levant Herald is too fond of speaking praisefully of Americans to be popular with the Sultan. 
he does not relish our sympathy with the Cretans, and therefore that paper has to be particularly cir circumspect in order to keep out of trouble. Once the editor, forgetting the official notice in his paper that the Cretans were crushed out, printed a letter of a very different tenor from the American consul in Crete, and was fined two hundred and fifty dollars for it. Shortly, he printed another from the same service, source, and was imprisoned three months for his pains. I think I could get the assistant editorship of the Levant Herald, but I am going to try to worry along without it. To suppress a paper here involves the ruin of the publisher, almost. But in Naples, I think they speculate on misfortunes of that kind. Papers are suppressed there every day and spring up the next day under a new name. During the ten days or a fortnight we stayed there, one paper was murdered and resurrected twice. The newsboys are smart there, just as they are elsewhere. They take advantage of popular weaknesses. When they find they are not likely to sell out, they approach a citizen mysteriously and say in a low voice, Last copy, sir. Double price? Paper just been suppressed. The man buys it, of course, and finds nothing in it. They do say... I do not vouch for it, but they do say that men sometimes print a vast edition of a paper with a ferociously seditious article in it, distribute it quickly among the newsboys, and clear out till the government's indignation cools. It pays well. Confiscation don't amount to anything. The type and presses are not worth taking care of. There is only one English newspaper in Naples. It has 70 subscribers. The publisher is getting rich very deliberately, very deliberately indeed. I shall want another turkey. I shall never shall want another Turkish lunch. The cooking apparatus was in the little lunch room near the bazaar. It was all open to the street. The cook was slovenly, and so was the table, and it had no cloth on it. The fellow took a mass of sausage meat and coated it round the wire, and laid it on a charcoal fire to cook. When it was done, he laid it aside, and a dog walked sadly in and nipped it. He smelt it first, and probably recognized the remains of a friend. The cook took it away from him and laid it before us. Jack said, I pass. He plays euchre sometimes, and we all passed in turn. Then the cook baked a broad, flat, wheaten cake guessed it well, greased it well with the sausage, and started towards us with it. It dropped in the dirt, and he picked it up and polished it on his breeches, and laid it before us. Jack said, I pass. We all passed. He put some eggs in a frying pan, and stood pensively prying slabs of meat from between his teeth with a fork. Then he used the fork to turn the eggs with, and brought them along. Jack said, Pass again. All followed suit. We did not know what to do, so we ordered a new ration of sausage. The cook got out of his wire, apportioned a proper amount of sausage meat, spat it on his hands, and fell to work. This time, with one accord, we all passed out. We paid and left. That is all I learned about Turkish lunches. A Turkish lunch is good, no doubt, but it has its little drawbacks. When I think how I have been swindled by books of oriental travel, I want a tourist for breakfast. For years and years I have dreamed of the wonders of the Turkish bath. For years and years I have promised myself that I would en yet enjoy one. Many and many a time in fancy I have lain in the marble bath and breathed the slumberous fragrance of eastern spices that filled the air then passed through a weird and complicated system of pulling and hauling and drenching and scrubbing by a gang of naked savages who loomed vast and vaguely through the steaming mists like demons, then rested for a while on a divan fit for a king, then passed through another complex ordeal, and one more fearful than the first, and finally swathed in soft fabrics, been conveyed to a princely saloon and laid on a bed of eider down, where eunuchs, gorgeous of costume, fanned me while I drowsed and dreamed, or contentedly gazed at the rich hangings of the apartment, 
the soft carpets, the sumptuous furniture, the pictures and the drink. Drank coffee, smoked the soothing narghili, and dropped at the, at the last into a tranquil repose, lulled by sensuous odors from unseen senses, by the gentle influence of the narghili's Persian tobacco, and by the music of fountains that counterfeited the pattern of summer rain. That was the picture, just as I got it from the incendiary books of travel. It was a poor, miserable impostor. The reality is no more like it than the five points are like the Garden of Eden. It received me in a great court, paved with marble slabs. Around it were broad galleries, one above the another, carpeted with seating mat seedy matting, railed with unpainted balustrades, and furnished with huge rickety chairs, cushioned with old rusty mattresses, indented with impressions left by the forms of nine successive generations of men who had reposed upon them. The place was vast, naked, dreary, its court a barn, its galleries, stalls for human horses, the cadaverous, half-nude varlets that served in the establishment had nothing of poetry in their appearance, nothing of romance, nothing of oriental splendor. They shed no entrancing odors, just the contrary. Their hungry eyes and their lank forms continually suggested one glaring, unsentimental fact. They wanted what they term in California a square meal. I went into one of the racks and undressed. An unclean starveling wrapped a gaudy tablecloth about his loins and hung a white rag over my shoulders. If I had had a tub then, it would have come natural, natural to me to take in washing. I was then conducted downstairs into the wet, slippery court, and the first things that attracted my attention were my heels. My fall excited no comment. They expected it, no doubt. It had belonged in the list of softening, sensuous influences peculiar to this eastern luxury. It was a softening enough, certainly, but its application was not happy. They now gave me a pair of wooden clogs, benches in miniature with leather straps over them, to confine my feet, which they would have done, only I do not wear number 13. These things dangled uncomfortably by the straps when I lifted up my feet and came down in awkward and unexpected places when I put them on the floor again and sometimes turned sideways and wrenched my ankles out of joint. However, it was all oriental luxury and I did what I could to enjoy it. They put me in another part of the barn and laid me on a stuffy sort of pallet which was not made of cloth of gold or Persian shawls, but was merely the unpretending sort of thing I had seen in the Negro quarters of Arkansas. There was nothing whatever in this dim marble prison but five more of these biers. It was a very solemn place. I expected that the spiced odors of Araby were going to steal over my senses now, but they did not. A copper-colored skeleton with a rag around him brought me a glass of decanted water with a lighted tobacco pipe in the top of it, and a pliant stem a yard long, with a brass mouthpiece to it. It was the famous Narghili of the East, the thing the Grand Turk smokes in the pictures. This began to look like luxury. I took one blast at it, and it was sufficient. The smoke went in a great volume down into my stomach, my lungs, even into the uttermost parts of my frame. I exploded in one mighty cough, and it was as if Vesuvius had let go. For the next five minutes, I smoked at every pore, like a frame house that is on fire on the inside. Not any more Narghili for me. The smoke had a vile taste, and the taste of a thousand infidel tongues that remained on that brass mouthpiece was viler still. I was getting discouraged. Whenever hereafter I see the cross-legged Grand Turk smoking his narghili in pretended bliss on the outside of a paper of Connecticut tobacco, I shall know him for the shameless humbug he is. This prison was filled with hot air. 
when I had got warmed up sufficiently to prepare me for a still warmer temperature, it took me where it was, into a marble room, wet, slippery, and steaming, and laid me out on a raised platform in the center. It was very warm. Presently, my man sat me down on by a tank of hot water, drenched me well, gloved his hands with a coarse mitten, and began to polish me all over with it. I began to smell disagreeably. The more he polished, the worse I, worse I smelt. It was alarming. I said to him, I perceive that I am pretty far gone. It is plain that I ought to be buried without any unnecessary delay. Perhaps you had better go after my friends at once, because the weather is warm, and I cannot keep long. He went on scrubbing and paid no attention. I soon saw that he was reducing my size. He bore hard on his mitten, and from under it rolled little cylinders like macaroni. It could not be dirt, for it was too white. He pared me down in this way for a long time. Finally, I said, It is a tedious process. It will take hours to trim me to the size you want me. I will wait. Go and borrow a jack plane. He paid no attention at all. After a while, he brought a basin, some soap, and something that seemed to be the tail of a horse. He made up a prodigious quantity of soap suds, deluged me with them from head to foot without wanting me to shut my eyes, and then swabbed me viciously with the horse tail. Then he left me there, a snowy statue of lather, and went away. I got tired of waiting. When I got tired of waiting, I went and hunted him up. He was propped against the wall in another room, asleep. I woke him. He was not disconcerted. He took me back and flooded me with hot water, then turbaned my head, swathed me with dry tablecloths, and conducted me to a latticed chicken coop in one of the galleries and pointed to one of those Arkansas beds. I mounted it and vaguely expected the odors of Araby again. They did not come. The blank unornamented coop had nothing about it of that oriental voluptuousness one reads of so much. It was more suggestive of the county hospital than anything else. The skinny servitor brought an argili, and I got him to take it out again, without wasting any time about it. Then he brought the world-renowned Turkish coffee that poets have sung so rapturously for, for many years, many generations, and I seized upon it as the last hope that was left of my old dreams of Eastern luxury. It was another fraud. Of all the unchristian beverages that have ever passed my lips, Turkish coffee is the worst. The cup is small. It is smeared with grounds. The coffee is black, thick, unsavory, unsavory of smell, and execrable in taste. The bottom of the cup has a muddy sediment in it, half an inch deep. This goes down your throat, and portions of it lodge by the way, and produce a tickling aggravation that keeps you barking and coughing for an hour. Here endeth my experience of the celebrated Turkish bath, and here also endeth my dream of the bliss the mortal revels in who passes through it. It is a malignant swindle, the man who enjoys it is qualified to enjoy anything that is repulsive to sight or sense, and he can invest it with a charm of poetry. He that can invest it with a charm of poetry is able to do the same with anything else in the world that is tedious and wretched and dismal and nasty. Chapter 35 We left a dozen passengers in Constantinople and sailed through the beautiful Bosporus and far up into the Black Sea. We left them in the clutches of the celebrated Turkish guide, faraway Moses, who will seduce them into buying a shipload of otter of roses, splendid Turkish vestments, and all manner of curious things they can never have any use for. Murray's invaluable guidebooks have mentioned faraway Moses' name, and he is a made man. He rejoices daily in the fact that he is a recognized celebrity. However, we cannot alter our established customs, 
to please the whims of the guides. We cannot show partialities this late in the day. Therefore, ignoring this fellow's brilliant fame and ignoring the fanciful name he takes such pride in, we call them Fergusons, just as we had done with all our other guides. It has kept him in a state of smothered exasperation all the time. We meant him no harm. After he has gotten himself up regardless of expense in showy baggy trousers, yellow pointed slippers, fiery fez, silken jacket of blue, voluminous waist sash of fancy Persian stuff filled with a battery of silver-mounted horse pistols, and has strapped on his terrible scimitar, he considers it an unspeakable humiliation <laughs> to be called Ferguson. It cannot be helped. All guides are Fergusons to us. We cannot master their dreadful foreign names. Sebastopol is probably the worst battered town in Russia or anywhere else. But we ought to be pleased with it. Nevertheless, for we have been in no country yet where we have been so kindly received, and where we felt that to be American was a sufficient visa for our passports. The moment the anchor was down, the governor of the town immediately dispatched an officer on board to inquire if he could be of any assistance to us, and to invite us to make ourselves at home in Sebastopol. If you know Russia, you know that this was a wild stretch of hospitality. They are usually so suspicious of strangers that they worry them excessively with the delays and aggravations incident to a complicated passport system. Had we come from any other country, we could not have had permission to enter Sebastopol and leave again under three days. But as it was, we were at liberty to go and come when and where we pleased. Everybody in Constantinople warned us to be very careful about our passports, see that they were strictly in regular, and never to mislay them for a moment. And they told us of numerous instances of Englishmen and others who were delayed days, weeks, and even months in Sebastopol on account of trifling informalities in their passports, and for which they were not to blame. I had lost my tra passport, and was traveling under my roommates, who stayed behind in Constantinople to await our return. To read the description of him in that passport, and then look at me, any man could see that I was no more like him than I am like Hercules. So I went into the harbor of Sebastopol with fear and trembling, full of a vague, horrible apprehension that I was going to be found out and hanged. But all that time my true passport had been floating gallantly overhead, and behold, it was only our flag. They never asked us for any other. We have had a great many Russian and English gentlemen and ladies on board today, and the time has passed cheerfully, cheerfully away. They were all happy-spirited people, and I never heard our mother tongue sound so pleasantly as it did when it fell from those English lips in this far-off land. I talked to the Russians a good deal, just to be friendly, and they talked to me for the same motive. I am sure that both enjoyed the conversation, but never a word of it either of us understood. I did most of my talking to those English people, though, and I am sorry we cannot carry some of them along with us. We have gone whithersoever we chase today, and have met with nothing but the kindest attentions. Nobody inquired whether we had any passports or not. Several of the officers of the government have suggested that we take the ship to a little watering place thirty miles from here, and pay the Emperor of Russia a visit. He is rusticating there. These officers said they would take it upon themselves to ensure us a cordial reception. They said if we would go, they would not only telegraph the emperor, but send a special courier over land to announce our coming. Our time is so short, though, and more especially our coal is so nearly out, that we judged it best to forego the rare pleasure of holding social intercourse with an emperor. Ruined Pompeii is in good condition compared to Sebastopol. 
here you may look in whatever direction you please, and your eye encounters scarcely anything but ruin, ruin, ruin. Fragments of houses, crumbled walls, torn and ragged hills, devastation everywhere. It is as if a mighty earthquake had spent all its terrible forces upon this one little spot. For eighteen long months the storms of war beat upon the helpless town and left it as the last saddest wreck that ever the sun looked upon. Not one solitary house escaped unscathed. Not one remained habitable, even. Such utter and complete ruin one could hardly conceive of. The houses had all been solid, dressed stone structures. Most of them were plowed through and through by cannon cannonballs, unroofed and sliced down from eaves to foundation. And now a row of them, half a mile long, looks merely like an endless procession of battered chimneys. No semblance of a house remains in such as these. Some of the larger buildings had corners knocked off, pillars cut into, cornices smashed, holes driven straight through the walls. Many of these holes are as round and as cleanly cut as if they had been made with an auger. Others are half pierced through, and the clear impression is there in the rock, as smooth and as shapely as if it were done in putty. Here and there a ball still sticks in a wall, and from it iron tears trickle down and discolor the stone. The battlefields were pretty close together. The Malakoff Tower is on a hill which is right in the edge of the town. The Redan was within rifle shot of the Malakoff. Ingerman was a mile away, and Balaklava removed but an hour's ride. The French trenches, by which they approached and invested the Malakoff, were carried so close under its sloping sides that one might have stood by the Russian guns and tossed a stone into them. Repeatedly, during three terrible days, they swarmed up the little Malakoff hill and were beaten back with terrible slaughter. Finally, they captured the place and drove the Russians out, who then tried to retreat into the town but the English had taken the Redan and shut them off with a wall of flame. There was nothing for them to do but go back and retake the Malakoff or die under its guns. They did go back. They took the Malakoff and retook it two or three times, but their desperate valor could not avail, and they had to give up at last. These fearful fields, where such tempests of death used to rage, are peaceful enough now, no sound is heard. Hardly a living thing moves about them. They are lonely and silent. Their desolation is complete. There was nothing else to do, and so everybody went to hunt and relics. They have stocked the ship with them. They have brought them from the Malakoff, from the Redan, Inkerman, Balaklava, everywhere. They have brought cannonballs, broken ramrods, fragments of shell, Iron enough to freight a sloop. Some have even brought bones, brought them laboriously from great distances, and were grieved to hear the surgeon pronounce them only bones of mules and oxen. I knew Blucher would not lose an opportunity like this. He brought a sack full on board and was going for another. I prevailed upon him not to go. He has already turned his stateroom into a museum of worthless trumpery which he has gathered up in his travels. He is labeling his trophies now. I picked up one a while ago and found it marked Fragment of a Russian General. I carried it out to get a better light upon it. It was nothing but a couple of teeth and part of the jawbone of a horse. I said with some asperity, The fragment of a Russian general? This is absurd. Are you never going to learn any sense? He said only, Go slow. The old woman won't, won't know any different. His aunt. This person gathers mementos with a perfect, perfect recklessness. Nowadays mixes them all up together and then serenely labels them without any regard to truth, propriety, or even plausibility. I have found
found him breaking a stone in two, labeling half of it, chunk busted from the pulpit of Demosthenes, and the other half, Darnick from the tomb of Abelard and Heloise, and I have known him to gather up a handful of pebbles by the roadside and bring them on board ship and label them as coming from twenty celebrated localities five hundred miles apart. I remonstrate against these outrages upon reason and truth, of course, but it does no good. I get the same tranquil, unanswerable reply every time. It don't signify. The old woman won't know any different. Ever since we three or four fortunate ones made the midnight trip to Athens, it has afforded him genuine satisfaction to give everybody in the ship a pebbles from the Mars Hill where St. Paul preached. He got all those pebbles on the seashore abreast the ship, but professes to have gathered them from one of our party. However, it is not of any use for me to expose the deception. It affords him pleasure and does no harm to anybody. He says he never expects to run out of mementos of St. Paul as long as he is in reach of a sand bank. Well, he is no worse than others. I noticed that all travelers supply deficiencies in their collections in the same way. I shall never have any confidence in such things again while I live. Chapter 36 We have got so far east now, a hundred and fifty-five degrees of longitude from San Francisco, that my watch cannot keep the hang of the time any more. It has grown discouraged and stopped. I did think it a wise thing. The difference in time between Sevastopol and the Pacific Ocean is enormous. When it is six o'clock in the morning here, it is some, somewhere about a week before last in California. We are excusable for getting a little tangled as to time. These distractions and distresses about the time have worried me so much that I was afraid my mind was so much affected that I never would have any appreciation of time again. But when I noticed how handy I was yet about comprehending when it was dinner time, a blessed tranquility settled down upon me, and I am tortured with doubts and fears no more. Odessa is about twenty hours' run from Sevastopol, and is the most northerly place in the Black Sea. We came here to get coal, principally. The city has a population of one hundred and thirty-three thousand, and is growing faster than any other small city out of America. It is a free port and is the great grain mart of this particular part of the world. Its roadstead is full of ships. Engineers are at work now, turning the open roadstead into a spacious artificial harbor. It is to be almost enclosed by massive stone piers, one of which will extend into the sea over 3,000 feet in a straight line. I have not felt so much at home for a long time as I did when I raised the hill and stood in Odessa for the first time. It looked just like an American city. Fine, broad streets, and straight as well. Low houses, two or three stories. Wide, neat, and free from any quaintness of architectural ornamentation. Locust trees bordering the sidewalks. They call them acacias. A stirring business look about the streets and the stores, fast walkers, a familiar new look about the houses and everything. Yeah, and a driving and smothering cloud of dust that was so like a message from our own dear native land that we could hardly refrain from shedding a few grateful tears and execrations in the old time-honored American way. Look up the street or down the street, this way or that way, we saw only America, there was not one thing to remind us that we were in Russia. We walked for some little distance, reveling in this home vision, and then we came upon a church and a hack driver, and presto, the illusion vanished. The church had a splendor-spired dome that rounded inward at its base and looked like a turnip turned upside down, and the hackman seemed to be dressed in a long petticoat without any hoops. 
these things were essentially foreign, and so were the carriages. But everybody knows about these things, and there is no occasion for my describing them. We were only to stay here a day and a night and take in coal. We consulted the guidebooks and were rejoiced to know that there were no sights in Odessa to see. And so we had one good, untrammeled holiday on our hands, with nothing to do but idle about the city and enjoy ourselves. We sauntered through the markets and criticized the fearful and wonderful costumes from the back country, examined the populace as far as the eyes could do it, and closed the entertainment with an ice cream debauch. We do not get ice cream everywhere, and so when we do, we are apt to dissipate to excess. We never cared anything about ice cream at home, but when we look upon it with a sort of idolatry now that it is so scarce in these red-hot climates of the East, we only found two pieces of statuary, and this was another blessing. One was a bronze image of the Duke de Richelieu, grand-nephew of the splendid cardinal. It stood in a spacious, handsome promenade overlooking the sea, and from its base a vast flight of stone steps led down to the harbor, two hundred of them. Fifty feet wide and a wide landing at the bottom of every twenty. It is a noble staircase, and from a distance the people toiling up it look like insects. I mention this statue and this stairway because they have their story. Richelieu founded Odessa, watched over it with paternal care, labored with a fertile brain and a wise understanding for its best interests, spent his fortune freely to the same end, endowed it with a sound prosperity, and one which will yet make it one of the great cities of the old world, built this noble stairway with money from his own private purse, and, well, the people for whom he had done so much, let him walk down these same steps one day, unattended, old, poor, without a second coat to his back, and when, years afterwards, he died in Sebastopol in poverty and neglect, they called a meeting, subscribed liberally, and immediately erected this tasteful monument to his memory, and named a great street after him. It reminds me of what Robert Burns' mother said when they erected a stately mom monument to his memory. Ah, Robbie, you asked them for bread, and they are giving you a stand. The people of Odessa have warmly recommended us to go and call on the emperor, as did the Sebastopolians. They have telegraphed, telegraphed his majesty, and he has signified his will willingness to grant us an audience. So we are getting up the anchors and preparing to sail, sail to his watering place. What a scratching around there will be now. What a holding of important meetings and appointing of solemn committees. And what a furbishing up of claw hammer coats and white silk neckties. At this fearful or, as this fearful ordeal we are about to pass through pictures itself to my fancy in all its dread sublimity. I begin to feel my fierce desire to converse with a genuine emperor, cooling down and passing away. What am I to do with my hands? What am I to do with my feet? What, am in, what in the world am I to do with myself? Chapter 37 We anchored here at Yalta, Russia, two or three days ago. To me, the place was a vision of the Sierras, the tall gray mountains that back it, their sides bristling with pines, cloven with ravines, here and there a hoary rock towering into view, long, straight streaks sweeping down from the summit to the sea, marking the passage of some avalanche of former times. All these were as like what one sees in the Sierras, as if one were a portrait of the other. The little village of Yalta nestles at the foot of an amphitheater which slopes backward and upward to the wall of hills and looks as if it might have sunk quietly down to its present position from a higher elevation. This depression is covered with the great parks and gardens of noblemen and through the mass of green foliage, the bright colors of the pa their palaces 
but out here and there like flowers, it is a beautiful spot. We have the United States Consul on board, the Odessa Consul. We assembled in the cabin and commanded him to tell us what we must do to be saved and tell us quickly. He made a speech. The first thing he said fell like a blight on every hopeful spirit. He had never seen a court reception. Three groans for the council. But he said he had seen receptions of the governor generals in Odessa and had often listened to people's experiences of receptions at the Russian and other courts and believed he knew very well what sort of ordeal we were about to essay. Hope budded again. He said we were many. The summer palace was small, a mere mansion. Doubtless, doubtless we should be received in summer fashion. In the gardens, we would stand in a row, all the gentlemen in swallowtail coats, white skins, and white neckties, and the ladies in light-colored silks or something of that kind. At the proper moment, twelve meridian, the emperor, attended by his suite arrayed in splendid uniforms, would appear and walk slowly along the line, bowing to some and saying two or three words to others. At the moment uh, his majesty appeared, a universal, delighted, enthusiastic smile broke, ought to break out like a rash among the passengers, a smile of love, of gratification, of admiration, and with one accord the party must begin to bow, not obsequiously, but respectfully and with dignity. At the end of fifteen minutes the emperor would go in the house, and we could run along home again. We felt immensely relieved. It seemed, in a manner, easy. There was not a man in the party, but believed that with a little practice he could stand in a row, especially if there were others along. There was not a man but believed he could bow without tripping on his coat tail and breaking his neck. In a word, we came to believe we were equal to any item in the performance, except that complicated smile. The consul also said, we ought to draft a little address to the emperor and present it to one of his aides-de-camp, who would forward it to him at the proper time. Therefore, five gentlemen were appointed to prepare the document, and fifty others went sadly smiling about the ship, practicing. During the next twelve hours, we had the general appearance, somehow, of being at a funeral, where everybody was <laughs> sorry the death had occurred, but was glad it was over where everybody was smiling and yet broken-hearted. A committee went ashore to wait on His Excellency, the Governor-General, and learn our fate. At the end of three hours of boding suspense, they came back and said the Emperor would receive us at noon the next day, would send carriages for us, would hear the address in person. The Grand Duke Michael had sent to invite us to his palace also, any man could see that there was an intention here to show that Russia's friendship for America was so genuine as to render even her private citizens objects worthy of kindly attentions. At the appointed hour, we drove out three miles and ascended, assembled in the handsome garden in front of the Emperor's palace. We formed a circle under the trees before the door, for there was no one no one room in the house, able to accommodate our threescore persons comfortably, and in a few minutes the imperial family came out bowing and smiling, and stood in our midst. A number of great dignitaries of the imp empire, in undress unit forms, came with them. Every bow, his majesty said a word of welcome. I copy these speeches. His character is, there is character in them, Russian character, which is politeness itself, and the general, genuine article. The French are polite, but it is often mere ceremonious politeness. A Russian imbues his polite sayings with a hardiness, both of phrase and expression, that compels belief in, belief in their sincerity. As I was saying, the Tsar punctuated his speeches with bows. Good morning. I am glad to see you. I am gratified. I am delighted. I am happy to receive you. All took off their hats, and the consul inflicted the address on him. He bore it with unflinching fortitude. 
then took the rusty looking document and handed it to some handed it to some great officer or other to be filed away among the archives of Russia in the stove. He thanked us for the address and said he was very much pleased to see us, especially as such friendly relations existed between Russia and the United States. The Empress said the Americans were favorites in Russia, and she hoped the Russians were similarly regarded in America. These were all the speeches that were made, and I recommended them to parties who present policemen with gold watches as models of brevity and point. After this, the Empress went and talked sociably for an Empress with various ladies around the circle. Several gentlemen entered into a disjointed general conversation with the emperor. The dukes and princes, admirals and maids of honor dropped into free and easy chat with first one and then another of our party. And whoever chose stepped forward and spoke with the modest little Grand Duchess Marie, the Tsar's daughter. She was fourteen years old, light-haired, blue-eyed, unassuming and pretty. Everybody talks English. The emperor wore a cap, frock coat, and pantaloons, all of some kind of plain white frilling, cotton or lemon, linen, and sported no jewelry or any insignia whatever of rank. No costume could be less ostentatious. He is very tall and spare, and a determined-looking man, though a very pleasant-looking one nonetheless. It is easy to see that he is kind and affectionate. There is something very noble in his expression when his cap is off. There is none of that cunning in his eye that all of us noticed in Louis Napoleon's. The Empress and the little Grand Duchess wore simple suits of foulard or foulard silk, I don't know which is proper, with a small blue spot in it. The dresses were trimmed with blue. Both ladies wore broad blue sashes about their waists, linen collars and clerical ties of muslin, low-crowned straw hats trimmed with blue velvet, parasols and fresh flesh-colored gloves. The Grand Duchess had no heels on her shoes, I do not know this of my own knowledge, but one of our ladies told me so. I was not looking at her shoes. I was glad to observe that she wore her own hair, plaited in thick braids against the back of her head, instead of the uncomely thing they call a waterfall, which is about as much like a waterfall as a canvas-colored ham is like a cataract. Kate taken the kind expression that is in the emperor's face and the gentleness that is in his young daughter's into consideration. I wondered if it would not tax the Tsar's firmness to the utmost to condemn a supplicating wretch to misery in the wastes of Siberia if she pleaded for him. Every time their eyes met, I saw more and more of what a tremendous power that weak, diffident schoolgirl could wield if she chose to do it. Many and many a time she might rule the autocrat of Russia, whose lightest word is law to seventy millions of human beings. She was only a girl, and she looked like a thousand others I have seen, but never a girl provoked such a novel and peculiar interest in me before. A strange new sensation is a rare thing in this humdrum life, and I had it here. There was nothing stale or worn out about the thoughts and feelings the situation and the circumstances created. It seemed strange, stranger than I can tell, to think that the central figure in the cluster of men and women chatting here under the trees, like the most ordinary individual in the land, was a man who could open his lips and ships would fly through the waves. Locomotives would speed over the plains. Couriers would hurry from village to village. A hundred telegraphs would flash the word to the four corners of an empire that stretched its vast proportions over a seventh part of the habitable globe, 
and a countless multitude of men would spring to do his bidding. I had a sort of vague desire to examine his hands and see if they were of flesh and blood, like other men's. Here was a man who could do this wonderful thing, and yet if I chose I could knock him down. The case was plain, but it seemed preposterous nevertheless, as preposterous as trying to knock down a mountain or wipe out a continent. If this man sprained his ankle, a million miles of telegraph would carry the news over mountains, valleys, uninhabited deserts, under the trackless sea, and ten thousand newspapers would prate of it. If he were grievously ill, all the nations would know it before the sun rose again. If he dropped lifeless where he stood, his fall might shake the thrones of half a world. If I could have stolen his coat, I would have done it. When I meet a man like that, I want something to remember him by. As a general thing, we have been shown through palaces by some plush-legged, filigreed flunky or other who charged a franc for it. But after talking with the company half an hour, the Emperor of Russia and his, and his family conducted us all through their mansion themselves. They made no charge. They seemed to take a real pleasure in it. We spent half an hour idling through the palace, admiring the cozy apartments and the rich but eminently home-like appointments of the place, and then the imperial family bade our party a kind goodbye and proceeded to count the spoons. An invitation was extended to us to visit the palace of the eldest son, the crown prince of Russia, which was near at hand. The young man was absent, but the dukes and countesses and princes went over the premises with us as leisurely as was the case at the emperor's, and conversation continued as lively as ever. It was a little after one o'clock now. We drove to the Grand Duke Michael's, a mile away, in response to his invitation previously given. We arrived in twenty minutes from the emperor's. It is a lovely place. The beautiful place nestles among the grand old groves of the park. The park sits in the lap of the picturesque crags and hills, and both look out upon the breezy ocean. In the park are rustic seats, here and there, in secluded nooks that are dark with shade. There are rivulets of crystal water. There are lakelets with inviting, grassy banks. There are glimpses of sparkling cascades, through openings in the wilderness of foliage. There are streams of clear water gushing from mimic knots on the trunks of forest trees. There are miniature marble temples perched upon old gray crags. There are airy lookouts whence one may gaze upon a broad expanse of landscape and ocean. The palace is modeled after the choicest forms of Grecian architecture and its wide colonnades surround a central court that is banked with rare flowers that fill the place with their fragrance, and in their midst springs a fountain that cools the summer air and may prob possibly breed mosquitoes, but I do not think it does. The Grand Duke and his Duchess came out and the presentation ceremonies were as simple as they had been at the Emperor's, in a few minutes, conversation was underway, as before. The Empress appeared in the veranda, and the little Grand Duchess came out into the crowd. They had beaten us there. In a few minutes, the Emperor came himself on horseback. It was very pleasant. You can appreciate it if you have ever visited royalty and felt occasionally that possibly you might be wearing out your welcome, though as a general thing, I believe, Royalty is not scrupulous about discharging you when it is done with you. The Grand Duke is the third brother of the Emperor, is about 37 years old, perhaps, and is the princeliest figure in Russia. He is even taller than the Tsar, as straight as an Indian, and bears himself like one of those gorgeous knights we read about in romances of the Crusades. He looks like a great-hearted fellow who would pitch an enemy into the river in a moment and then jump in and risk his life fishing him out again. The stories they tell of him show him to be of a 
brave, and de generous nature. He must have been desirous of proving the, that Americans were welcome guests in the imperial palaces of Russia, because he rode all the way to Yalta and escorted our procession to the emperors himself, and kept his aides scurrying about, clearing the road and offering assistance wherever it could be needed. We were rather familiar with him then, because we did not know who he was. We recognized him now, and appreciated the friendly spirit that prompted him to do us a favor that any other Grand Duke in the world would have doubtless declined to do. He had plenty of servitors who he could have sent, but he chose to attend to the matter himself. The Grand Duke was dressed in the handsome and showy uniform of a Cossack officer. The Grand Duchess had on a white alpaca robe, with the seams and gores trimmed with black barbed lace, and a little gray hat with a feather of the same color. She is young, rather pretty, modest and unpretending, and full of win and politeness. Our party walked all through the house, and then the nobility escorted them all over the grounds, and finally brought them back to the palace about half past two o'clock to breakfast. They called it breakfast, but we would have called it luncheon. It consisted of two kinds of wine, tea, bread, cheese, and cold meats, and was served on the center tables in the reception room and the verandas, anywhere that was convenient. There was no ceremony. It was a sort of picnic. I had heard before that we were to breakfast there, but Blucher said he believed Baker's boy had suggested it to his imperial highness. I think not, though it would be like him. Baker's boy is the famine breeder of the ship. He is always hungry. They say he goes about the staterooms when the passengers are out and eats up all the soap. And they say he eats oakum. They say he will eat anything he can get between meals, but he prefers oakum. He does not like oakum for dinner, but he likes it for lunch, at odd hours, or anything that way. It makes him very disagreeable, because it makes his breath bad and keeps his teeth all stuck up with tar. Baker's boy may have suggested the breakfast, but I hope he did not. It went off well, anyhow. The illustrious host moved about from place to place and helped to destroy the provisions and keep the conversation lively, and the Grand Duchess talked with the veranda parties and such as had satisfied their appetites and straggled out from the reception room. The Grand Duke's tea was delicious, they gave one a lemon to squeeze into it, or iced milk, if he prefers it. The former is best. This tea is brought overland from China. It injures the article to transport it by sea. When it was time to go, we bade our distinguished hosts goodbye, and they retired happy and contented to their apartments to count their spoons. We had spent the best part of half a day in the home of royalty and had been as cheerful and comfortable all the time as we could have been in the ship. I would as soon have thought of being cheerful in Abraham's bosom as in the palace of an emperor. I supposed that emperors were terrible people. I thought they never did anything but wear magnificent crowns and red velvet dressing gowns with dabs of wool sewed on them in spots, and sit on thrones and scowl at the flunkies and the people in the parquet and order dukes and duchesses off to execution. I find, however, that when one is so fortunate as to get behind the scenes and see them at home and in the privacy of their firesides, they are strangely like common mortals. They are pleasanter to look upon than they are in their theatrical aspect. It seems to come as natural to them to dress and act like other people as it is to put a friend's cedar pencil in your pocket when you are done using it. But I can never have any confidence in the tinsel kings of the theater after this. It will be a great loss. I used to take such a thrill and pleasure in them, but hereafter I will turn me sadly away and say, This does not answer. This isn't the style of king that I am acquainted with. When they swagger around the stage in jeweled crowns and splendid robes, I shall be feel bound to observe that all the emperors that ever I was personally acquainted with wore the commonest sort of clothes and did not swagger, 
and when they come on the stage, attended by a vast bodyguard of suits and helmets and ten breastplates, it will be my duty as well as my pleasure to inform the ignorant that no crowned head of my acquaintance has a soldier anywhere about his house or his person. Possibly it may be thought that our party tarried too long or did other improper things, but such was not the case. The company felt that they were occupying an unusually responsible position. They were representing the people of America, not the government, and therefore they were careful to do their best to perform their high mission with credit. On the other hand, the imperial families, no doubt, considered that in entertaining us, they were more especially entertaining the people of America than they could by showering attentions on a whole balloon of platoon of ministers, plenio pentiere, and therefore they gave to the event its fullest significance as an expression of goodwill and friendly feeling toward the entire country. We took the kindnesses we received as attentions thus directed, of course, and not to ourselves as a party. That we felt a personal pride in being received at the, as the representatives of a nation, we do not deny that we felt a national pride in the warm cordiality of that reception cannot be doubted. Our poet has been rigidly suppressed from the time we let go the anchor. When it was announced that we were going to visit the Emperor of Russia, the fountains of his great deep were broken up, and he reigned ineff ineffable bosh for four and twenty hours. Our original anxiety as to what we were going to do with ourselves was suddenly transformed into anxiety about what we were going to do with our poet. The problem was solved at last. Two alternatives were offered to him. He must either swear a dreadful oath that he would not issue a line of his poetry while he was in the Tsar's dominion, or else remain under guard on board the ship until we were safe at Constantinople again. He fought the dilemma long, but yielded at last. It was a great deliverance. Perhaps the savage reader would like a specimen of his style. I do not mean this term to be offensive. I only use it because the gentle reader has been used so often that any change from it cannot be cannot but be refreshing. Save us and sanctify us, and finally, then, see good provisions we enjoy while we journey to Jerusalem. For so man proposes, which it is most true, and time will wait for none, nor for us too. The sea has been unusually rough all day. However, we have had a lively time of it, anyhow. We have had quite a run of visitors. The Governor General came, and we received him with a salute of nine guns. He brought his family with him. I observed that carpets were spread from the pier head to his carriage for him to walk on though I have seen him walk there without any carpet when he was not on business. I thought maybe he had what the accidental insurance people might call an extra hazardous polish. Policy joke, but not above mediocrity, on his boots, and wished to protect them. But I examined and could not see that they were blacked any better than usual, it may have been that he had forgotten his carpet before, but he did not have it with him, anyhow. He was an exceedingly pleasant old gentleman. We all liked him, especially Blucher. When he went away, Blucher invited him to come again and fetch his carpet along. Prince Dolaruki and a grand admiral or two, whom we had seen yesterday at the reception, came on board also. I was a little distant with these parties at first, because when I have been visiting emperors, I do not like to be too familiar with people I know only by reputation, and whose moral characters and standing in society I cannot be thoroughly acquainted with. I judged it best to be a little offish at first. I said to myself, princes and counts and grand admirals are very well, but they are not emperors and one cannot be too particular about who he associates with. Baron Wrangel came also. He used to be Russian ambassador at Washington. I told him I had an uncle who fell down a shaft and broke himself in two, as much as a year before that. That was a falsehood, 
but then I was not going to let any man eclipse me on surprise and adventures merely for the want of a little invention. The Baron is a fine man, and is said to stand high in the Emperor's confidence and esteem. Baron Ugern Sternberg, a boisterous, whole-souled old nobleman, came with the rest. He is a man of progress and enterprise, a representative man of the age. He is the chief director of the railway system of Russia, a short a sort of railroad king. In his line, he is making things move along in his in this country. He has traveled extensively in America. He says he has tried convict labor on his railroads and with perfect success. He says the convicts work well and are quiet and peaceable. He observed that he employs nearly 10,000 of them now. This appeared to be another call on my resources. I was equal to the emergency. I said we had 80,000 convicts employed on the railways in America, all of them under a sentence of death for murder in the first degree. That closed him out. We had General Tottleben, the famous defender of Sevastopol during the siege, and many inferior army also, and also Navy officers, and a number of unofficial Russian ladies and gentlemen. Naturally, a champagne luncheon was in order, and was accomplished without laws of life. Toasts and jokes were discharged freely, but no speeches were made, save one thanking the Emperor and the Grand Duke through the Governor-General for our hospitable reception, and won by the Governor-General in reply, in which he returned the Emperor's thanks for the speech, etc., etc.